Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Fortunately, I fell on my feet so I can still talk and you'll understand me, although I can't talk too much. Professor Hogland. The very nice to, to hear you, and particularly the, the nice words that you said about the, this beautiful island. So thank you for coming. Gracias a, a... I'd like to thank the deputy, the Minister of the Environment, Jose Balbueno, Alejandro Malovny, for inviting us to this conference. And I'd like to also thank all the sponsors that have made it possible for all of us to come here. And of course, I'd like to thank the Recicla Canary Island Foundation, along with the organizers, who's enabled all of us to be here and one way or another, for those of you who are listening, these, pres listening to these presentations, I hope that they're interesting and I hope this is, this is the start of a beautiful friendship that will help all of us to work towards our objectives. My name is Carlos Monreal. I work in a company called Plastic Energy. We work on developing technology that will convert one fraction of our rubbish, a small fraction, which is a specific kind of plastic which is very difficult to recycle. In the present, some of the slides I've seen that I'm going to present, I'll hope to be able to explain this to you. We didn't just develop the technology, we also invested in it. We built plants and we've also invested somewhere around 50 million euros in instruments and stuff in order to make this dream come true. It's a very simple process. Plastic, as you know, comes from petroleum, from oil. About 10% of all the oil that's produced in the world is used to make different kinds of plastics. So what we do is the reverse process we take the plastic waste and turn it back into a kind of oil or an, a, carbo, a hydrocarbon derivative. I'll try and explain how we do this. We get the plastic waste, less than 10% of all the rubbish that we produce on a day-to-day -day basis. The plastic waste is treated we um, put it into a process whereby we generate this, carbo, this hydrocarbon that can be used for different kinds of applications. As I was saying, this process basically consists of receiving the plastic that is mixed with organic matter because it doesn't have to be clean plastic at the beginning. It can be any uh, cl plastic of any kind of color. It can be contaminated with uh, any other kind of substance. Or it doesn't have to be low density or high density polyethylene. It can be mixed with any kind of plastic. First of all, we sort it in order to try and avoid from an economic point of view to prevent that all the raw material coming into the process to make it as uniform as possible so that we know exactly what comes in and this way we can forecast the quality and the production ratios of the plant. This plant, once we've cleaned it up and treated it as much as possible, it goes through what we call an extruder which will increase the temperature of the raw material to all around 300 degrees centigrade. It's then sent into a reactor where it generates uh, energy, so this, which turns the plastic into, can, into a gas which gives us the uh, hydrocarbon chain. We separate the short links from the long links and we can use it for different kinds of applications. We can either distill it if we do this, the hydrocarbon chains, we separate the light components from the top, such as kerosene, or at the bottom, it could be commercial diesel that can be used directly in any kind of vehicle, depending on local legislation and the obligations you have of mixing the hydrocarbons. It's a very simple process, as I said, because from there, what we do is we store it so that I can use it and take it wherever I want. It's a very simple model, as I've seen. It's the same everywhere. We don't believe 
in a state that has to force users to comply or they get penalized or punished. We don't believe in that. We don't think that's the, the future of our society. We think that just as way if we accepted technology and we all use mobile phones, nobody forces us to use an iPhone or a Samsung for our communications. And this, by the same way, the most efficient way is to persuade society with facts that this is technology that we can use and it will help us, but we're certainly not going to force anybody to do anything. But our working model is very simple. I've been working on this for some five years. Obviously, we try to ensure the raw material that we get because there are different ways of ensuring our supply of raw materials. Each of our plants processes in the current models, which are scalable, and we work between 20 and 22 tons a day of raw materials that we process each day, this generates about 300 and 330 days a year. We generate approximately 38,000 barrels of refined oil or hydrocarbons. We then test this. We have a high conversion rate, as we can see. It's over 80%, all of which depends on the origin of the raw materials. I'm talking about raw material. I'm not talking about waste at any time. And then on the other hand, we get different kinds of products, which depending on, on the price, the sales price and the market, either the customer will buy kerosene, kerosene diesel, or some synthetic gas that we can use for manufacturing uh, plastic again. Then on the other hand, we sell the product itself. So one way or another, we look for customers who can ensure a long-term procurement. And this is just another commodity. We're competing in the model. We receive no subsidies. It's a commodity. If prices go up, that's great for us. And if not, we have to be more efficient in order to make a return on this process. One important thing from the sustainable point of view, practically each of these plants, which are about seven, eighty thousand metric tons that would be buried from this, we can reduce this to about 300, 350 metric tons that really go into the, act, the landfill. So from an environmental point of view, that's a major impact for treating a waste that really can't be dealt with in any other way. This is not a theory. As I've said, we already have a plant up and working in Merida on mainland Spend, as you can see from this photos. Another plant, this is a photo taken in March 2015, close to Seville. So let's have a look at the kind of raw materials we can use. Anything and everything, with the only exception, we don't want PVC, or as little as possible, 0.5% of the weight can be PVC, but no more. And we don't want PET either, for several reasons. First of all, it has a low content of hydrocarbons, and secondly, because there's a major market. And we're only interested in the raw materials that are difficult to recycle and the PET is very easy. The problem of plastic, as we say, in Europe, we manufacture a million tons of plastics every week. A million tons a week in Europe and a million tons a day, a year of plastics is produced. And this is the objective that we're heading for. It's a very small fraction, but it's an important fraction because as we've seen in other presentations, plastic persists in the landfills for years and years. So what we do, we produce plastics. We produce over 300 million tons a year and it's growing, as we can see throughout the year, significantly. Another essential point is the situation of landscapes, landfills, sorry, you can't distinguish the different countries, but in red, this is the percentage of rubbish that ends up in landfills. In some countries in the north of Europe, as we just heard from Professor Hogland, we can find that there's very little landfill, but there's enormous energy recovery using the incinerates. 
that is one of the alternatives that I was talking to my colleagues before, an example of Gipuzkoa, where they use door-to-door -door collection in a highly complex system, and I'll finish right now, but in 30 days in Gipuzkoa, they're going to put out a major incinerator for tender to work on all the waste for Gipuzkoa. So all the experience of the last three or four years, something must have happened to convince them to build an incinerator. This is directly related with any, whatever technology you're going to use is directly related to the landfills and what happens to them. And just to round off, I'll skip this, Tenerife is going to be no exception. In Tenerife, we have a very specific project, thanks to a fantastic businessman, David Gustaman. He will be able to develop and work with the Island Council of Tenerife in order to build a plant that will be an international benchmark that will treat some 22 tonnes a day. We'll process this material. First of all, we'll do a mechanical recycling of part of the fraction for uh, some 2,000 tonnes a year and convert this into pellets. And anything that cannot be mechanically recycled, we're going to do a chemical recycling process for which we are going to create, I can't see it from here, this um, hydrocarbon vapour which will create this synthetic oil which will be reused for making plastics again. And this way we avoid having to buy oil of uh, fossil fuels to, to manufacture these plastics. This is our objective and we hope that by the beginning of 2018 when we can organise the second edition of this conference maybe we hope to be able to give you more information on this project. Just to keep this interesting, in July we're sponsoring a flight from Sydney to Perth in Australia that will just use fuel generated in the Almeria plant. In August we are organising another flight from Sydney to Melbourne and in September the BBC is going to start an awareness program suggesting that there's a, an alternative way of treating difficultly recyclable plastic. So we're going to organize a flight from San Francisco to Alaska sponsored by the BBC by Sir Richard Attenborough. And we hope to raise awareness in society. We do have an industrial solution that's sustainable and profitable that will enable us to tackle problem of plastics that currently end up in the ocean. Thank you very much.